and welcome to Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today's video is part of a series I do where I compare books with their movie adaptation. And before we get into the book and movie, I want to warn you that there will be spoilers for both, both the book and the movie. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, you should do that first and then come back and watch this video. I also want to tell you that this is available as a podcast. I will link to Spotify and Apple down below because those are the two most popular platforms, but I am on other platforms as well. So these tend to be about 30 minutes, but especially if they're longer and it works better for you to listen to it, that is available. And I also want to say that even though my podcast is called Why the Book Wins, <laughs> I do love movies as well. And there are times where the movie wins when comparing book first movie. So it is not always the book because I do love movies. And oftentimes, you know, before I even started this podcast, the reason I would read a book was because I liked the movie. And so I wanted to read the book for it. And so I love both essentially. And I think I give a fair, you know, view of both book and movie, despite my name being why the book wins. <laughs> anyway, thank you for clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, let's get right into the book first movie. Thank you for joining me here today. My name is Laura and we are going to be talking about Holes, which is a novel by Lewis Satcher published in 1998. And then the movie was directed by Andrew Davis and was released in 2003. Now this is a very well-known movie. It's very popular, or at least, you know, it was popular at the time it came out. I remember loving it as a kid and all of my classmates loved it. So it was just popular at the time and it has held up really well. And so I think a lot of people already know the storyline, but I'm gonna give a summary anyway. So Stanley Yelnats the fourth is walking home one day when a pair of shoes fall from the sky. Turns out these shoes belong to a famous baseball player and he had been donating them to charity. So they are worth a lot of money. And when Stanley is found with them, he is arrested and sent to Camp Green Lake, which is a juvenile rehabilitation center where they have the boys dig one hole a day, like a five foot wide by five foot deep hole. And the warden thinks that having them dig one hole a day will help build character. While Stanley is here, he befriends some of the other kids, specifically a kid named Zero. And also while he's there, he realizes that the warden doesn't think digging holes builds character and that she in fact is looking for something which she thinks is buried out in this desert wasteland. And long story short, Stanley and Zero end up finding this treasure. Turns out it actually belongs to Stanley's family anyway. Also Stanley and Zero then being friends was fate to have them meet because it turns out Stanley's ancestor had made a promise to Zero's ancestor, but he had broken that promise. And because of that, the Elnats family was cursed. And so they just had bad luck for over a hundred years because of this curse. But through his friendship with Zero, he ends up breaking the curse and everything is all good. And at the end of the story, like I said, they find the treasure and then Camp Green Lake is closed down for like malpractice or whatever. And the warden and them are sent to jail, I think. And because the curse is lifted, Stanley's dad, who is an inventor, finally has an invention that works. And yeah, it's just happily ever after, essentially. And throughout this story, as we're hearing about Stanley, we hear the history of Camp Green Lake because at one point there actually was a lake there. And we hear about this school teacher named Kate who had fallen in love with a guy named Sam who was black. And because this was back in the day, it was illegal. And so a guy, Trout Walker, sees Sam and Kate kissing. And so after that, he burns down the schoolhouse. They kill Sam. After that, Camp Green Lake is cursed and it does not rain at all until the very end of the book when Stanley breaks. Well, he breaks his curse he had with zero but that somehow affects the curse that happened when Sam died, even though they're like two separate curses. Anyway, but Kate, after the death of Sam, she becomes kissing Kate Barlow, an outlaw. And after she kills a man, she will kiss him. And she is the one who buried the treasure on Camp Green Lake. And the warden who is looking for this treasure is the descendant of Trout Walker, who is the bad guy, because he is the one that killed Sam. And now he is hunting for this treasure. And it's just this, this generational thing. So all of Trout Walker's or his descendants have spent their lives trying to find this treasure and they haven't been able to. So that's the basic summary. But the book review, so I thought this was a great kid's book, especially for like age 10 and up, I guess. I didn't read this book when I was a kid, but I think my brother had. But I also realized that Lewis Satcher wrote the Wayside School books, which I definitely did read as a kid and remember loving. So that was funny because I didn't realize he was the same writer. But yeah, this book in particular kind of reminded me of Ghetto Cowboy, which is one I cover like... I don't know, over six months ago now, I guess, which is another kid's book for like ages 10 and up. And both books cover like some serious topics, but they do it in a kid-friendly way. And so I think it's good for kids to read books like this as a way to open up the dialogue on these topics. And these books can get them thinking about it and talking to their parents about it and things like that. But Holtz, for example, deals with racism, poverty, bullying, and greed. So yeah, I did enjoy this book. It is so similar to the movie as we will get into. 
which you can already see that this video is so short because there are so few changes. It is just exactly, they are exactly alike essentially. I even debated not even filming this video because they're so similar. And so I felt like I wouldn't have much to say, but I do think it's a fantastic story. And so it's one I wanted to talk about anyway. But the author does have a cameo in the movie. So Sam is a salesman. He sells like onion related stuff. And so Lewis Thatcher is a character that walks up and his wife buys an onion tonic to help him grow hair because he's bald. So yeah, that was Lewis Thatcher. But to move on to the movie. So like I said, very nostalgic for me to watch this movie, but it also just holds up really well. And you have great performances from an amazing cast. We have a young Shia LaBeouf, we have Sigourney Weaver, John Voight, Henry Winkler, Eartha Kitt, and Patricia Arquette. And all of them I think are wonderfully cast. Sigourney Weaver and John Voight are two stands out. And Shia LaBeouf, he's great and very likable as Stanley. But yeah, Sigourney Weaver and John Voight, and the guy who plays Mr. Pandansky, I should have written his name down. He's one of those guys that has like three words in his name. Anyway, they're all amazing. And then also there are these yellow spotted lizards, which are an important part of the story because they are poisonous. But the yellow spotted lizards in the movie are portrayed by bearded dragons that were painted with like animal friendly paint for the spots. But I thought that was so fun. At the time as a kid, I had never heard of bearded dragons, but watching it now as an adult who has had experience with bearded dragons and who loves reptiles, I just love seeing the bearded dragons in this movie, so that was fun. So yeah, like I said, not many changes, so this is gonna be a short video, but some people might like that. I've had people comment on some of my past videos saying that they're too long and they I should just you know cut to the chase and keep it short. So maybe some people will like this. But to talk about the changes, so for starters in the book, Stanley is overweight and he is bullied at school because of this. And in general, it, he says how he is just not happy. Like he loves his family, but he's just not a happy kid. He blames his bullying on his no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing, great, great grandfather. And in both book and movie, he says how he doesn't know if he believes in the curse, but it's nice to have something to blame when things don't go well. And in the movie, Stanley's not overweight and the, we also don't hear anything about him being bullied. And in general, he seems like a happy kid when we see the flashbacks to him living at home. Speaking of him living at home, in the movie, his grandpa lives with him, whereas in the book, it was just his mom and dad. But I thought this was a great addition. I really enjoyed the character of the grandpa in the movie. And then with Stanley and Zero, so while, so Stanley finds out that Zero can't read or write and Zero asks him if Stanley can teach him. And in the movie, he agrees. And while they're doing their lessons, Zero can see how tired Stanley is. And so he's like, hey, I can help you dig your hole for part of the day. And they're like in the hole together, digging it together as, Stan, as Zero is helping him. Whereas in the book, Zero asks Stanley if he can teach him and Stanley is like, no, I'm too tired from digging holes all day. I don't have the energy to teach you. And so Stanley, and so Zero offers to help Stanley dig his hole. And when Zero is digging the hole, Stanley will just like sit out on the ground above him and just kind of hang out for an hour. So there's some slight changes there because in the movie he would dig with Zero and also he agreed to teach him and then Zero saw how tired he was and offered to help dig his hole. So Stanley is a bit more likable in that sense in the movie, but in both this causes contention amongst the other boys because they're like, hey, that's no fair that Zero is helping Stanley and it becomes this thing. Also to talk about Zero, like I don't understand why Mr. Pandansky specifically is so mean to him because we know Zero showed up like just not long before Stanley. So he hasn't been there long and yet Mr. Pandansky is so mean to him and I just didn't understand that. Like he hadn't been there long enough to build a reputation to warrant, you know, being treated so badly. So yeah, I don't know, it just, I didn't understand why he was so mean to him, but anyway. And then another detail that the movie adds that I really liked. So when Stanley Fi finds Kiss and Kate's lipstick, he gives it to X-Ray because that's the deal they had, but it is the end of the day. And so he tells X-Ray, you should wait till tomorrow and pretend you found it tomorrow. And so the next day they're in a different location and X-Ray acts like that's where he found the lipstick and they start like digging way more in that area. When Stanley, like he's looking over to where the hole had been and he's like, wow, like that's where it was. We're digging in the wrong spot. And then later when Zero and Stanley run away, they come back to the holes and they dig in the hole where the lipstick was found and that's when they find the treasure. And the movie adds the detail where the hole where the lipstick was, before he found the lipstick, there had been this large boulder that he had placed beside the hole. And the boulder just happens to look like Madame Zeroni, who is Zero's ancestor. But anyway, so I liked that the movie had him have this rock here, this boulder, cause it made it so obvious that that was his hole where the lipstick was found, right? Because in the book, there wasn't any signifier like that. And so how on earth would he have known which hole he found the lipstick in? Cause there are thousands of holes 
So how could he possibly have known which one he found the lipstick in? So I like that the movie had it where he knows which one it is because there's this giant boulder next to it. And then some changes with the past with Kate and Sam. So for starters, when, so Trout Walker sees Sam and Kate kissing, and then we see that the schoolhouse is being burned. And in the book, Kate goes to the sheriff and he has no help and he wants a kiss from her. And this, because the sheriff asks for a kiss and she turns him away and then later she kills him and that's when she gives him his kiss. So that's why she's called Kissing Kate. Anyway, she goes to the sheriff, he's no help. In the book, she goes and she finds Sam and she's like, Sam, they're gonna kill you, we need to get away. And so they go in Sam's boat. However, Trout Walker has a motorboat. And so he is able to catch up to them and he kills Sam. Whereas in the movie, she goes to the sheriff and then she runs outside and she looks at the lake and she sees Sam out on the lake and Trout Walker catches up to him and he is shot. So in the book, she was in the boat with Sam, whereas in the movie, she wasn't. And then in the movie, we flash forward to the end of Kate's life and she is out on Camp Green Lake, which is not a camp yet, but it, she's out on Green Lake, which at this point has dried up because a drought started, like I said, after Sam's death. And so she is there and Trout Walker and his new wife find her and they're like, you know, where's the treasure? We know it's buried here. And she's like, I'm never gonna tell you, you know, you and your descendants are gonna be digging forever and you'll never find it. And then a yellow spotted lizard comes out she has a bite her hand and she dies. Whereas in the book, it's slightly different because Trout Walker and his wife come up to her, they threaten her, she tells them she'll never tell them where it is. And then they make her take her shoes off and have her walk in the desert, which is crazy hot. So they kind of torture her in a way. And then at some point during this, she sees a yellow spotted lizard, has it bite her and she dies. And then one last one is that in the end of the movie, we find out that Mr. Sir is a guy named Marion and that he is a criminal and he is wanted and he is arrested, whereas that wasn't the case in the book. But in both book and movie, definitely the movie, I think the book too, Camp Green Lake, the drought is broken. So now it's going to become a nice luscious area again, I guess. And it gets turned into a Girl Scout camp, which I really liked. I thought it was a nice touch because throughout the book and movie, Mr. Sir is constantly telling the boys like, this ain't the Girl Scouts and you know, you better get to work. So it's ironic that it then becomes a Girl Scout camp. And that is it for the changes. <laughs> like so much of this movie is word for word right from the book. I don't know if I mentioned this, but Louis Satcher adapted it himself and he stayed very faithful to his own novel. Like the dialogue, like honestly, so much of it <laughs> is exactly the same. And between book or movie, book first movie, I would say the movie wins because they are so similar. So you're getting the same story either way, but with the movie, you get to just see it brought to life and you get to see these amazing performances and you get to see Bearded Dragons. So really it's just a win, win, win. And yeah, I guess that kind of wraps it up, but Holes, it's a great movie. Like I said, I think it holds up really well and I really enjoyed it this time around. I love the part where Sigourney Weaver is talking to Mr. Pandansky about filling the canteens and he is saying he already filled them and so she sloshes it around to show him that there is still empty space. Like I said, John Voight was really funny. I love Shia LaBeouf and the kid who plays Zero. And so yeah, this was just a really great movie, really well done, a great story. And I would recommend the book, like if you have a child who hasn't seen the movie yet, I think it would be great for them to read the book or just watch the movie too, I guess. But you know, it's always good to encourage reading in children. So maybe encourage them to read the book and then watch the movie afterwards. But yeah, the movie wins here, even though I did really enjoy the book. Thank you guys for watching this video or listening to this podcast. If you are on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and to give this a thumbs up and join me next week for another kid's book. I'm covering Matilda by Rodal Dahl. I don't know who did the movie, but yeah, that's a fun one. So join me next week for that and I'll see you later. Bye.